the Maricopa Trail, where does it lead? There are some shocking claims coming out of the Maricopa County audit. Uh, there are counterclaims by Maricopa County itself. Where does the truth lie? This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. <laughs> needs this voice. The times are crazy and a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. There are some stunning claims that are coming out of the uh, Maricopa audit. There was an initial hearing laying out not final conclusions, but sort of provisional early findings. Uh, and these findings are pretty explosive. Now, we have to be a little careful here, by which I mean that we don't want to have either an excess of timidity or an excess of boldness. An excess of timidity leads you to basically say, well, the election was basically fine, and unless I see smoking gun evidence right in front of me, uh, I'm not gonna do anything. This seems to be the sort of Bill Barr approach, which leads to really inaction, not doing anything, um, not even pursuing a real investigation. But there is a, a danger on the other side, which is that if you grab onto these findings, you trumpet them, you become wedded to them. Um, and in fact, here is Liz um, Harrington, the spokesman for Trump, and she's been trumpeting them, if I can use that phrase. The problem is that these are not final conclusions. They can get shot down. There, is, uh, there are counterclaims coming out of Maricopa County. And we don't really want to have our hearts broken a second time. By that, I mean, we don't want to latch on to things that then prove to be sort of elusive. And then we're like, wow, at the end of it, we sort of have nothing once again. So we want to be wedded to the truth and our boldness needs to be based on that. Now, having said all that, let's look at some of these specific claims coming out of the, um, the audit. Number one, Apparently, 11,326 voters in Maricopa County were not on the voter rolls on Election Day, on 11-7-2020, but they were on the voter rolls in December, and they were marked as having voted in the November 3rd election. Wow. So these are people who are seemingly ineligible to vote, who nevertheless voted, and their names magically appeared on the voter roll later. Now... A second claim, uh, very startling, uh, there was a request for um, mail-in ballots, but 70,000 more, 74,000 specifically, more mail-in ballots came back than were sent out in the first place. Wow, where did those ballots come from? If they weren't sent out by Maricopa County, uh, how did they turn up? Whose ballots are they? Who, who concocted them? Who made them? What is the source of how to explain this rather large discrepancy? Uh, and then we go down the list, 25,000 duplicate ballots, allegedly. Uh, there were bleed through votes, which were apparently the result of something we heard about right in November, uh, the sort of Sharpie controversy, the controversy in which apparently prior to election day, voters were told to use ballpoint pens, uh, but then Maricopa provided a late instruction to give voters Sharpies. And the problem with a Sharpie, kind of obvious, we all know this to be true, the Sharpie bleeds through the page, causing problems in, in the counting of the vote. Now, um, all of this uh, taken collectively uh, raises a lot of eyebrows because uh, even the number of votes that were certified doesn't really match the number of votes that were sent over to the audit. So why is that? Uh, one set of votes certified, another number given to the auditors? Um, what's going on here? More questions, I have to say, than answers. Now, just as you have the uh, jubilant declaration on the part of Trump's side, I won, look over here, uh, this, this shows it, this clinches it, you've got an equally equivalent uh, triumphalism on the other side. Here is left. Uh, this is CNN. Fact check. <laughs> Arizona audit chief baselessly raises suspicion about 74,000 ballots. So now let's look at what CNN has to say. And CNN basically goes, there's no evidence of any fraud or significant error with these ballots. 
Um, so how to account for them? Well, here's CNN's way of accounting for them. They say that uh, in-person early voting accounts for those ballots. In other words, the, uh, the 74,000 votes were in-person early votes. And those were tallied together with the mail-in ballots. So and essentially what they're saying is that the auditors have made a schoolboy error, a schoolboy error. Uh, I find this a little hard to believe. Uh, it seems ridiculous that this would in fact be the case, uh, but this is a counterclaim and we've got to take it uh, seriously. Uh, the auditor has also raised the issue um, that uh, the verification processes in Maricopa County were gradually eased. There was initially a so-called 20-point point of comparison verification. After some time, it became 10 points and became five points. And then, quote, eventually they were just told to let every single mail-in ballot through. Basically, no verification. Now... Uh, Maricopa County says that was not the case. Our signature requirements remain the same. But of course, the question isn't whether your on paper requirements remain the same, but whether in fact the practice that arose out of the rules, sometimes rules are not applied exactly in the way that they're made, whether there was in fact a loosening, in fact, an abandonment of, of standards altogether. So I've been trying to follow this ping pong of uh, claim and counterclaim. Uh, Mar here's Maricopa County responding itself to the, um, the 74,000 um, ballot claim. And they say, quote, it's a kind of an um, enigmatic statement. They go, Maricopa County calculated the true number of requests and returns. So Maricopa is basically saying that the auditors can't count. Either that or they're saying that there is some true number that's not the the kind of obvious or manifest number, there's a kind of deeper number that they have excavated. They don't claim how they got this so-called true number. Um, Maricopa County also claims that when they're talking about the, um, um, the numbers added to the voter rolls after election day, these are the 11,326 votes that I mentioned earlier, Maricopa says, this is likely referring to people who cast provisional ballots. In other words, they cast ballots, the ballots are in question. They might have, for example, moved to a different part of the state. So these ballots are kind of have a question mark on them. They are later determined to be legitimate or not legitimate. And so it's the provisional ballots that could, I underline the word could, account for these uh, 11,000 names. Because notice in Maricopa County doesn't say these are provisional ballots. They say, quote, this is likely referring to provisional ballots. This is, again, a question that needs to be answered. Did the auditor somehow miss the obvious fact they just forgot about the provisional ballots? And, um, and finally, Maricopa County says this, which I think is uh, perhaps the strangest statement of all. They say that, um, they say that at the end of the day, although with these disputes going back and forth, Maricopa County tweets out, Maricopa County election professionals have the experience and the proven processes to accurately count ballots. Cyber ninjas, that's the, uh, the firm doing the audit, do not. So what we seem to be getting here is that Maricopa County is claiming that vote counting is some kind of abstruse process. It's not something that can be made transparent. Even if you get, give it to professional auditors, you give it to a firm that has statisticians, has all kinds of people with expertise looking at this, uh, they don't have enough expertise. Maricopa County has got the sort of true formula for vote counting. It's evidently not a one, two, three, four, here's for Trump, here's for Biden, here's something uncertain. This is how we decide it. Apparently, this is a highly arcane process that requires unbelievable expertise unavailable to cyber ninjas. Well, wait a minute. In a democracy, you've got to have a process that is somehow obvious to voters. Um, you can't say, well, you know, we're going to be running a... Um, uh, a raffle or we're going to be running a, a casino, but gee, you know, the process by which this roulette wheel spins is only known to the people sitting in the dark room upstairs. Um, they're the ones who manipulate, they're the experts at it. No one else can figure this out. Leave it to us because we're the professionals. This is absurd. So all of this doesn't tip the scale completely one way or the other to me. It only suggests how important it is that we get the full report, that there is critical debate 
Part of the what frustrates me about the absence of a judicial process is we aren't able to see these claims kind of up against each other the way that it, you would see them in a courtroom or in a trial. No cross-examination, no, no chance for each side to challenge the other. And so the whole issue leaves you with this kind of gnawing feeling that something terrible seems to have gone terribly wrong here, but we're not exactly sure what and in what magnitude. Even with people canceling him, retailers canceling him left and right, Mike Lindell forges ahead. He doesn't back down. That's what I love about this guy. But he does rely on us uh, to step in, to support him, and to sample and uh, enjoy his incredible products. Here's a little clip, by the way, of Lindell talking to me about it. Listen. We came on board your show, I think, in January. And, and the audiences and the people we just reacted and helped out and bought directly. And we passed the savings on to them. Uh, promo code Dinesh. <laughs> you know? and, uh... Yeah, so that's what um, that's where we come in. Um, and we uh, we need to keep going with this guy. Now, the good thing about him is that he makes great products and he's offering great specials. He's got an amazing special on his towels that we really can't pass up. Debbie and I are just kind of going crazy on it and ordering more towels. Do we have enough towels? Yeah, but we're going to get more. Um, now, the good thing about Mike's towels is they're different from normal towels. Normal towels just don't seem to really dry you. They kind of feel soft and lotiony in the store, but then you take them home and they don't really absorb. Well, why not? Because the towel companies typically import the product and then they add these softeners to make the towels feel good, but they don't really dry you very well. Now, Mike Lindell has completely solved this problem. He created the best towel company right here in the USA. MyPillow has proprietary technology to create towels and not only feel soft, but actually absorb and leave you feeling fresh and dry. MyPillow towels are all made here in the country and they come with the MyPillow 60-day money-back guarantee. For a limited time, Michael Lindell is offering a ridiculously good deal on his six-piece towel set, which includes two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths, all made with USA cotton. They're soft yet absorbent. Regularly, $109.99. He's selling them for $39.99, practically giving them away. So call 1-800-876-0227 or go to MyPillow.com, but make sure to use promo code Dinesh. Again, that number, 1-800-876-0227 or go to MyPillow.com to get the discount. You need to use promo code Dinesh. I have to confess, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in Rona McDaniel, the head of the RNC. Uh, I see her blustering tweet, social media censorship has got to stop, uh, this kind of declaration. But what is the RNC really doing? Now, there's an um, interesting clash that has emerged between Rona McDaniel and Jenna Ellis. Uh, Jenna Ellis is a young lawyer who was um, on the Trump side during the election controversy. And um, this has become sort of acrimonious. Rona McDaniel blocks Jenna Ellis. Jenna Ellis accuses Rona McDaniel of lying. I'm actually going to get Jenna on the podcast to talk about this in uh, more detail. But uh, what this has to do with is a, an email that was apparently sent by Justin Reamer. Justin Reamer is the chief lawyer, the chief counsel to the RNC. And this was during the whole election fraud controversy, the aftermath of the election. And Justin Rima evidently said, uh, why are we wasting our time talking about election fraud? This is all ridiculous. The Trump people are a joke. And this was an email that was that then um, was forwarded to uh, Jenna, who showed it to Rudy Giuliani, who showed it to Bernie Carrick. They were apparently all at an event together. And these people went berserk because they realized that the RNC, uh, what they saw as their own team, is undercutting their efforts to try to document and prove election fraud. Apparently, Rudy Giuliani called this uh, Justin Rima guy and said, listen, you're, you know, you're not going to be working for us much longer. You're, you're going to be out of a job. And then they asked Rona McDaniel to get rid of this guy. This is a guy on our side. And by the way, let's remember that the Republican National Committee was raising an ocean of money to fight election fraud. And this was the guy who was tasked with doing it. Well, evidently, he had no interest in doing it. But you know what? This guy, Justin uh, Reamer, he's still the chief counsel of the RNC. He never was fired then. He hasn't been fired to this date. 
And so the question arises, is the RNC playing a double game? Are they raising money to fight election fraud while in a sense having no intention of fighting election fraud? Were they sort of backstabbing Trump? Now, of course, what makes this kind of messy and complicated is that Trump, of course, has supported Rona McDaniel as head of the RNC. So this is the fact of Trump, where we've seen it in many other cases, dealing with people around him who don't really share his values or not particularly loyal to him. And, um, and my own experience with the RNC is that these people play, these people do play double games. Uh, and for them, politics is a business. Uh, so when I think about why the RNC, think about it, it may seem odd, why would the RNC, sort of Trump's team, um, want to not look into a Republican candidate's claims and see if those claims can be vindicated? Why would they not want to do that? Well, the answer, and it's very insidious and it's kind of frightening, is that the RNC actually thinks it's better for Trump to lose. Now, you might think, why would the RNC want Trump to lose? And the simple answer in one word, fundraising. It is um, a well-known sort of axiom of politics. And by the way, this extends beyond uh, the RNC. It extends even to, I remember that when I was in Washington, D.C., there were conservatives who would joke that their books would sell more and their careers would be in better shape when they were in opposition because they've got, they've got sort of um, people to attack. And so it gives their a kind of energy to their side. So similarly, uh, in the fundraising department, people give money out of fear. Oh, the country is going down. I, we better stop this Biden guy. So the RNC knows this. And they go, wait a minute, you know, if Trump wins, we're kind of, we're going to, in the second term, people be, kind of become a little lax. They kind of take things for granted. But if Biden comes in, it's threatening to ruin the country, RNC fundraising is going to skyrocket. And sure enough, I take a look, here it is in the Washington Examiner. National Republican Congressional Committee raises more money in the first half of 2021 than at any time in its history. That's the first line of the article. NRCC uh, boasts a record $45 million in the second quarter. Uh, by the way, that compares to $36 million for the Democrats. And the Republicans now go into the midterms, at least as of now, with $55 million in cash. Uh, the Democrats are 44 million. So you see here how, even though you might think the Democrats are the party in power, can't, can't they raise more money because they have access to the president? No. Interestingly, being in the opposition is a very good way to raise money because it taps into the anxiety of people about the direction in which the country was going. When I made my Obama film, I went to the RNC uh, and I went to the Romney campaign. I showed them the film, which had been tested uh, for its effectiveness in swinging independence against Obama. And the remarkable thing is neither the RNC nor the Romney campaign, they couldn't have been less interested. Uh, at one point, somebody um, on the campaign or, or somebody connected with the campaign said to me, well, Dinesh, you know what? Why don't you send us your film and we'll kind of take a look at it from a fundraising point of view. In other words, if people give us, uh, they give money to the RNC, they give $500 or thousand dollars. We'll maybe send them a thank you, which is going to be a DVD of your film. And I was like, wait a minute, I didn't make the film to be a fundraising tool for the RNC. You're raising all this money. Aren't you raising the money for something? Aren't you raising the money to actually win the election? But this is how these people operate. They think of politics in terms of lining their own pockets. Uh, they are, I have to say, a kind of corrupt operation. In this sense, they resemble the swamp. They're part of the swamp. They're in the swamp swamp, and they are swamp creatures themselves. Uh, it'd be very naive if Trump didn't at some level know that. Uh, but I think what this uh, shows is that we've got to be really cautious where we put our money. We want to give our money to trusted people who are really fighting the good fight, not people who are taking our money uh, with on the one side and then laughing at us uh, and undermining the projects that we're trying to fund on the other. You know, Debbie and I lost a lot of our trees during the Texas winter storm and we had to replace them. And so we did with a company called Fast Growing Trees. We just got two magnolia trees and two gardenia trees from Fast Growing Trees. And we absolutely love them. For my viewers, by the way, I'm including a few photos that you can see here. But for listeners, you just kind of have to take my word for how great they look. Skip the big box stores and head to fastgrowingtrees.com. This is the world's largest online nursery. No more waiting in line, messy cars, digging through a lackluster selection. Just go to fastgrowingtrees.com and choose from thousands of varieties of trees, shrubs, and plants 
expertly curated to thrive in your area and delivered to your door. We received ours in two days. Whether you're looking for shade, privacy, fruit trees, or just added color for your yard, every plant is shipped with a well-developed root system ready to explode with new growth. There's a better way to buy trees and shrubs, plants for your home and yard, fastgrowingtrees.com. Planting season is here. Join over 1 million satisfied gardeners at fastgrowingtrees.com. Plus, the 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee means your plants will arrive happy, healthy, and ready for planting. Now through July 31st, go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Dinesh for 15% off. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Dinesh. In what would seem to be a flagrant violation of the First Amendment, the Biden administration is now openly, nakedly, blatantly uh, working with social media platforms, notably Facebook, to uh, restrict, um, deplatform, ban, censor users that are promoting what the Biden team calls misinformation or disinformation. Uh, recently, Jen Psaki uh, said, uh, look, we're flagging posts, I'm quoting, we're flagging problematic posts for Facebook that spread disinformation. And she goes on to say that, uh, by the way, this isn't just about Facebook. If you're banned on one social media platform, uh, the, um, the government's position is that you should be banned on all platforms. You should be prevented, essentially, from being able to disseminate your views. Uh, and this idea um, has been echoed by others, notably the Surgeon General. So all of these guys are on board and they're kind of blithe about it. They're, they say this confidently. They don't think that this is something to be embarrassed about. In fact, when you listen to Jen Psaki talk, you almost get the impression that she treats Facebook as like a government agency, someone that she can give direction to and they're gonna take the direction because, you know, uh, this is a kind of um, shared operation, a coordinated uh, move uh, between the government and the private sector. Now, again, um, who is going to speak up here for free speech? Who's going to speak up for the First Amendment? Certainly not the ACLU. The ACLU, by the way, which once took a near absolutist position on free speech. Now, no one is claiming uh, that the First Amendment is completely absolute. And by that, I mean that there are literally no exceptions. The exceptions tend to be very far out. And um, they tend to be, uh, people give the famous example of shouting fire in a crowded theater. But even shouting in a fire in a crowded theater is not by itself um, an exception because you can shout fire in a crowded theater if there's a fire. It's just that if you can't do it as a prank to cause a stampede, the harm there is the physical harm of people running over each other. Uh, and so the speech in this case is purely malicious, directed toward that destructive end. So this is what we mean by an exception. It is an exception that's so far out. It has nothing to do with the normal give and take of political debate. And it's amazing that the ACLU, dead silent on this topic, in other words, probably secretly supportive of what the Biden people are trying to do. Now, I'm well aware, of course, that the First Amendment limits the government. It doesn't limit the private sector. This is often gleefully pointed out by leftists and by Democrats. But here we have the government working in tandem with the private sector, or to put it somewhat differently, here we have the government trying to get the private sector to carry out things that it would be unconstitutional for the government itself to do. And the question is, is that allowed? Is that constitutional? Now, to understand this issue a little more deeply, let's think of what I'm saying here. Uh, try to imagine the government, for example, hiring a private security firm and saying to them, listen, we, the government, are, according to the Fourth Amendment, prohibited from unreasonable search and seizure. We can't unreasonably, without an was probable cause, without a warrant, we can't just search somebody's car, we can't just search somebody's house. But listen, you can't. You're a private agency, so we'll direct you to do it. You carry it out uh, at our instruction and on our behalf. Uh, but this way, we will be immunized from any responsibility because, quote, we didn't do it ourselves. Uh, or think about other constitutional rights, the right to assemble, the right to vote, equal justice under the law, um, the right, all of these rights. The government, can the government hire private agencies and pay them uh, or subsidize them in some way and tell them, listen, you go undermine these rights on our behalf uh, because we can't directly do it, but there's nothing limiting you from doing it. 
Uh, or think, for example, if the government paid Facebook and Twitter to ban people. That would clearly violate the First Amendment because there are, the government would be directly implicated in providing a subsidy, a payment, for a private platform to carry out something that for the government would be clearly unconstitutional. But the government in this case is doing exactly that. Now, they're not forking over money to Facebook or to Twitter, but they have provided them with the Section 230 exemption, which is a huge exemption. It essentially immunizes these platforms from legal liability for content that appears on the platform. It's a ma I don't even know if you could put a dollar amount on the value of this subsidy. And Congress, by the way, is always threatening these social media platforms. You can hear this in the hearings. We'll take away this subsidy if you don't do as we say. We want you to ban more people. We want you to regulate content. And if you don't do what we say, so Section 230 is being used both as a and as a stick. Um, now, the Supreme Court has actually been really clear on this, and it's been clear on this in a series of precedents uh, going back uh, almost 75 years. Cases like Norwood versus Harrison, uh, Railway Employees Department versus Hansen, which is 1956. Let me just quote from the Supreme Court in the Norwood case. Quote, the government may not induce, encourage, or promote private persons to accomplish what it, it here meaning the government, is constitutionally forbidden to accomplish. And that's it right there. The government, in other words, does not escape responsibility uh, or accountability to the Constitution because it channels its unconstitutional actions through private agencies. I think all of this uh, boosts uh, the strength gives added fire to the Trump lawsuit in particular, but more broadly suggests that there's a battery of litigation that can come out here if Facebook, in fact, takes orders from the Biden administration, uh, takes the people that they flag and bans them. Those people will have, uh, I think, First Amendment claims uh, that they are being shut down, they are being suppressed, they are being censored by their own government. How did you choose what internet service provider to use? The sad thing is most of us have very little choice because internet service providers operate like monopolies in the regions they serve. They use this monopoly power to take advantage of customers. Data caps, streaming throttles, the list goes on. But worst of all, many of these service providers log your internet activity and sell that data on to other big tech companies or advertisers. Now, to prevent your service provider from seeing your internet activity, you've got to use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is a simple app for your computer or smartphone that encrypts all your network data and tunnels it through a secure VPN server so that your internet service provider cannot see any of your activity. Just think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, the list of people you've messaged, sites you've visited, videos you've watched, all of this gets tracked by tech giants who can then sell your information for profit. That's the reason I use ExpressVPN. I'm not um, that computer savvy, but all you have to do is download the app, tap one button on your device, and you're protected. Express, ExpressVPN does all of this without slowing your connection. That's why it's rated the number one VPN service by CNET and Wired. Stop handing over your personal data to internet service providers and other tech giants who mine your activity and sell off your information. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep me private online. Visit expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Dinesh to get three extra months free. Go to expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. We live in a society where racism is um, interminably, unceasingly talked about, and yet evidently very hard to find, at least very hard to find in any recognizable or obvious fashion. And therefore, there's a project undertaken by the left in academia uh, and also in the media to, you may say, ferret out racism where no racism is readily apparent. In other words, it's a project to uncover, we could call it hidden racism. Here's a classic example. This is from The Atlantic. 
by the way, a once reputable magazine. I was happy many years ago, 1991, I believe, to publish the cover story in The Atlantic, a long excerpt, almost the whole magazine, from my book, Illiberal Education. Today, The Atlantic is a joke. It's an embarrassment. It's um, it's uh, taken the same kind of fall that, say, The New York Times has. Well, here's their article, The Hidden Bigotry of Crosswords. Now, I'm going to read, uh, I didn't bother to read the article, but I read the first line, which kind of tells you what they're saying. The popular puzzles are largely written and edited by older white men who dictate what makes it into the grid and what is kept out. Well, let's say that's true. I have no reason not to believe it's true. How does this prove, quote, hidden bigotry? The very fact that... uh, uh, older white men are making the selection. What if I were to say that um, in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, the coaches who are basically scouting for young players, promising young players, are predominantly black? Would that prove that these coaches are secret bigots? They're giving preference only to blacks. They don't want white players on the court. Uh, it wouldn't follow at all. Um, so, Again, what you have here is you have a claim of racism, and yet nothing is provided to actually support that claim. Here's an even more preposterous example. This is an article, by the way. I see this in um, an article that says, uh, Science Journal claims that geology is racist. Geology, the study of rocks, the study of the earth. And apparently there's a group of scientists who have collected the petition saying that uh, the reason geology is racist is that blacks are really afraid to enter the field because if they carry a hammer, um, this may put their life in danger because people may think, cops may think that these people are a danger to society. So this is so far-fetched, we have to probe it a little bit further. Evidently, uh, I'm now quoting from this uh, petition. The petition was collected by a woman, uh, a professor named Hendrader Ali at Fort Hayes State University geology department. Let's just assume this is not a geology department that's kind of making waves worldwide. But nevertheless, she's gotten 20 academics to sign on. And I'm reading a quote, holding objects, e.g. a rock hammer, has been viewed as suspicious and continues to be used as a reason to call the police on black people. And then, of course, you can see the short step from here to George Floyd and blah, blah, blah. Um, And the petition goes on to say that there are in the field of geology, quote, racist expectations around manners, around manners, clothing, hair, professional attire, language and diction. So evidently, they're calling for a modification of the manners, the kind of professional etiquette. Uh, Geologists need to be able to dress differently. I didn't realize there was a uniform requirement. They apparently have to be more liberal about how they can wear their hair. I didn't realize there was a hair requirement. And then apparently there are standards of of diction, presumably not uh, for speaking, but for publishing in the geology journals that need to be uh, abandoned or at least loosened. Quote, racism thrives in geoscience. Geoscience organizations function alongside the same racist ideologies and practices shaping society. Now, there's a geologist who comments on this in the article, and he makes the point, he goes, listen, a lot of the geology students, in fact, a lot of science students in this country are foreign students. They come to America because they believe America is leading the world in the sciences. They believe that there's pioneering research to be done, and by coming to American universities, you can do that kind of research. Now, these people are interested in science. So if we take the field of science and we reduce it to this kind of Um, we make diversity the governing principle of science instead of experimentation, attempts to verify hypotheses, the scientific method. If we move to something else, social justice, then the best students around the world who come here will stop coming because this is not what they come to learn. Uh, If there's some internal American thing going on where we're trying to do something other than geology and discover the age of the earth and the rock formations and what they tell us about nature, uh, this is going to lead to a collapse of credibility of American universities. Look, I think it's already happening to some degree. It's already happened. Uh, But the left, quite clearly, in all these cases, is only making things worse. 
Look, they keep talking about hidden racism, and the point I want to make is these forms of racism are always hidden. There's hidden, uh, tr uh, the hidden racism of traffic jams. By the way, that was in the 1619 Project. The hidden racism of migratory birds. I read an article on that. The hidden racism of math equations. And now the hidden racism of rock hammers. The hidden racism of crosswords. Well, think about it. If racism is so hidden, why is it a problem? If it's so hidden, it means that no one really directly experiences it. If it's so hidden, it means that no one can really find it. It takes academic sleuthing. It takes a kind of between-the-lines expertise to even find it. Maybe if it's so hidden, it isn't even really there. On July 4, 1776, our country declared independence from taxation from a government an ocean away. Now, today, our government is the one imposing oppressive taxes, while at the same time sending our wealth overseas and driving the value of the dollar into the ground through reckless spending. This is the time to declare your independence for your savings. Cut your ties to the U.S. dollar and invest in gold and silver with Birch Gold Group. If you haven't yet reached out to Birch Gold to diversify part of your IRA or 401k, into a precious metals IRA. Hey, do it today. Text Dinesh to 484848 and get a free information kit on protecting your savings with gold. I buy my gold from Birch Gold. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, and over 10,000 happy customers. Talk to them. Have them help you safeguard your investments. Text Dinesh to 484848 to claim your free information kit and to speak to a precious metals expert on holding gold and silver in a tax-sheltered account. Again, text Dinesh to 484848 and protect your savings today. I want to talk about the um, root of critical race theory, which is in an earlier movement uh, dating back to the early part of the 20th century, which was called critical theory. So the critical theory movement was, in a sense, the parent that gave birth to an offspring called critical race theory. If you think about critical race theory, so-called CRT, it was merely the addition of the idea of race to critical theory. That's where the R comes from. And not just an addition, but a sort of a displacement. Uh, critical theory was basically based on, on class. It sought to interpret, analyze, but also produce a revolutionary outcome based upon class division. So I want to just trace this uh, history because it helps us understand um, the offspring, critical race theory, a little bit better. Now, um, Karl Marx, who was, of course, the... Um, the founder, if you will, of Marxism. Uh, and um, Marx believed that a society was divided between an entrepreneurial class, what he called the capitalists, and a working class that would continue to become poorer and poorer over time. By the way, Marx's view was directly contradicted by Lincoln, who said the opposite. Let me read a quote from Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln says, there is not of necessity any such thing as the free hired laborer being fixed to that condition for life. And then he, Lincoln points to what's going on around him. He goes, many independent men everywhere in these states, meaning in these United States, a few years back in their lives were hired laborers. The prudent penniless beginner in the world labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while, and at length hires another new beginner to help him. This is the just and generous and prosperous system which opens the way to all, gives hope to all, and consequent energy and progress and improvement of conditions to all. So Lincoln is actually describing how things actually happen. Marx had no idea. And Marx thought that the laborer would become angrier and angrier and then would foment a revolution based upon the kind of unbridgeable chasm between the two classes. And this never really happened. This created a kind of crisis in Marxism. But there's one part of Marxism that lives on. And that is where Marx said that philosophers, I'm not quoting Marx, have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. 
And so you see here that Marx was not just about analysis, not just about understanding. One of the fallacies that people have today about critical race theory, and in fact, the critical race theorists exploit this. Oh, no, no, we're just helping people to understand racism. We just want to show them about what happened in American history. No, with, for Marxism, it was never just about showing or understanding or analyzing. It was about using knowledge as a spur to revolution. It was, as Marx says, the point is to change the world. The point is to change society, to restructure society. So Marx, in this sense, turned Hegel on his head. Hegel was trying to understand what Hegel considered to be the hidden uh, movements of history. Marx said, yeah, we want to understand, but that's not enough. Now, Marx's understanding, as I mentioned, was flawed, in fact, was fatally flawed. And so what happened later was that Marxists in the 20th century, notably the Italian communist uh, Gramsci, uh, said that we need uh, to um, we need to infiltrate the institutions of society. This was Gramsci. I'm now quoting him. His phrase was the long march through the institutions. His idea was that what the left needs to do is they need to um, overcome and infiltrate the family and the school and the artistic community and the church and political parties, media outlets, even independent court systems. So this project you can see uh, that came out of revolutionary Marxism is very much with us today. The key difference uh, is that it takes critical theory. Critical theory here is the Marxist doctrine that the point of theory is to drive wedges in society, to create and magnify divisions, to spur revolution and remaking of society. And um, the only innovation that critical theory does with all of this is it infuses the new idea of race. And it's a very cunning infusion, why? Because with Marx, there was always the problem that the class grievance that he kept talking about wasn't really there. That the working class guy wanted to improve his condition, as Lincoln says, but he didn't really want to go overthrow his boss. He wanted to sort of become the boss. And so Marx was building this idea of division, but building it on a little bit of a sociological fiction. But, says the leftists in America in recent decades, racial grievance is real. It is anchored in history. And so it's actually easier to tap those veins of division. Obama, I think, understood this very well. It's much easier to set people against each other, black against white, um, uh, and uh, ultimately male against female, straight against gay. You see here the full development beyond race uh, to other forms, uh, so-called intersectionality, multiple forms of oppression, multiple wedges of division. But the point I want to make is that this critical race theory, CRT, has its roots in CT, critical theory. And critical theory is itself an offspring of the failed doctrine of Marxism. I want to talk to you about balance of nature. This is kind of our recipe, our secret for feeling good and staying healthy. Uh, I just turned 60 this year and people ask me, hey Dinesh, you know, you're pretty fired up when you give speeches, you've got a lot of energy and I'm in great health. And part of the reason is fruits and veggies. Now, there are some fruits and a lot more veggies that I just don't like to eat. So fortunately, I found balance of nature. And this is the cool thing. I take three capsules of the fruit. This is it right here. Uh, beautiful, you know, smells like fruit, delicious aroma. And these are the veggies and they smell like veggies. And so Debbie and I are both doing it. We take our six daily capsules and we're set. Uh, we get all our vital nutrients sourced from 31 fruits and veggies every single day. And Debbie swears by this. Um, this is the balance of nature, fiber and spice. It's a powder, you dissolve it in water or juice. Debbie says she's never been more regular. So join us and experience the balance of nature difference yourself. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% off and free shipping on your first balance of nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751. That number again, 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com. Don't forget to use discount code AMERICA. There's a new development in the Hunter Biden story, which is that it now comes out, it's only now coming out, 
that uh, the prosecutor who is um, looking into whether or not Hunter Biden has tax violations, all that money that he got from foreign entities, did he pay taxes on it? And number two, uh, did Hunter Biden violate any of our laws that deal with uh, foreign entangle entanglements? So all of this is under investigation. It's being investigated by a um, Delaware U.S. attorney named David Weiss. And David Weiss was uh, ready to issue not just subpoenas, but search warrants on Hunter Biden to get all the information pertinent to his inquiry. But then he realized that it was right before the 2020 election. So what did he do? He decided to be completely quiet about it until the election had passed. Now, right away, we see here how a top official, a deep state guy, who is charged with doing a job, which is pursuing the trail of investigation, is nevertheless calibrating this job to the political exigencies of the moment. In other words, he's trying to help Biden and he's trying to avoid helping Trump. So you might think that this guy is a big left winger in Delaware. And uh, it turns out that he's um, a Republican. He's a kind of moderate Republican, but he was appointed to his job by none other than Donald Trump. Wow. Now he was appointed by Trump apparently on the recommendation of Delaware's two Democratic senators. Apparently they understood better whose side David Weiss was on. Uh, and you see here the way in which Trump I think was careless in the kind of people that he appointed, people who subsequently turned out to do him no good. I mean, no one is asking David Weiss to be a Trump man, Trump's wingman in the way that say Eric Holder said that he was Obama's wingman. We're just asking David Weiss to do his job. And if it comes time to issue subpoenas, issue them. Um, uh, let the public make up its mind about what the significance of all this is. You just do your job, but no one asked you to uh, manipulate um, the schedule in order to um, wait for the election to be over. And then, because that is a, that is a direct subsidy. Uh, this is a, that is a direct donation, you might say, uh, to the Biden camp. And that's really what David Weiss was doing. So the plot here really thickens because we are rightfully outraged at the media suppressing the Hunter Biden story. We're rightfully outraged at the digital platforms for censoring the New York Post and others who tried to report on the Hunter Biden story. But it turns out that the prosecutors too are in a way protecting, not just Hunter. Notice the protection here is to Joe Biden. Uh, they're gonna be doing uh, the investigation of Hunter. They just don't want it to be, uh, to have any negative impacts on Joe making his way across the finish line. And let's remember that this has always been a scandal. The Hunter Biden business dealings are not Hunter operating on his own. They're Hunter Biden and the laptop confirms this in spades. Hunter Biden is working in collaboration with his father. His father is kind of the mafia Don and Hunter Biden, the son, James Biden and Frank Biden, the brothers, they're the bag men of the operation. So you see the level of protection that, that Democrats get. Um, Obama had it, the Clintons had it. There's almost a sense in which these guys can get away with anything. And this is why they do these shenanigans because they know that. They know that somehow they will get out of the noose. They will stay one step ahead of the posse. The kind of rules that would floor any Republican um, are not applied when it comes to Democrats. Uh, and in this case, sadly, uh, our side and Trump himself bears at least a little bit of the responsibility for allowing these atrocities to continue. I want to talk to you about 
Mike Lindell's My Pillow and how it changed Debbie's sleeping habits. When she started sleeping on Mike's pillow, she began to sleep right through the night. Uh, 52 million women her age aren't sleeping through the night. So take it from Debbie, Mike's pillows work. Now these wonderful pillows won't go flat. You can wash and dry them as often as you want and they maintain their shape. They're made in the USA. Now for a limited time, Mike is offering his premium My Pillows for the lowest price ever. You can get the queen size premium My Pillow for $29.98. It's normally $69.98. So that's a $40 savings. King pillows are only $5 more. All the My Pillow products come with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to mypillow.com and use promo code Dinesh. By the way, you'll get deep discounts on all the My Pillow products: the Giza Dream bed sheets, the My Pillow mattress topper, the My Pillow robes, the My Pillow towel sets, which, as I mentioned earlier, are incredibly priced and include two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths made with USA cotton. They're soft yet absorbent. These are regularly, the towel set regularly, $109.99, and Mike is offering, incredibly, $39.99. So call 1-800-876-0227 and use promo code Dinesh, or just go to mypillow.com. Don't forget to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H, Dinesh. I want to... Um, examine, or perhaps I should say begin examining, a short story by the Russian writer Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy is one of the not just greatest of Russian writers. On the Russian pantheon, he would um, to have the top rank along with just a handful of people, Chekhov, uh, Pushkin, uh, Dostoevsky, maybe Gogol, so there's a handful of Russian writers of the top rank, and these are writers of worldwide significance. Um, now with Tolstoy, his greatest works are two, uh, War and Peace, uh, a massive epic and uh, unforgettable story, although it takes a while to read it because it's 700 or so pages long, and an equally long and uh, breathtaking and fascinating uh, work, Anna Karenina. Sometimes it's good to be introduced to a writer, though, by looking at a shorter work that just gives you a glimpse into how this writer thinks. And uh, why read uh, short stories? Why, why read fiction at all? Well, the, way, the reason is not just the kind of beauty of the language, but not just the fascination of being drawn into the writer's world. One of the uh, remarkable things about writers is that they create a world and they allow you to live in it, at least for the duration of their story. And then at the end of it, you're sort of sorry to come out of it, and you're sorry to be sort of back in the real world, so to speak. So they create an unbelievably rich experience. But they're also able to examine questions that are harder to examine, you may say, in the normal world, or even in the writing of nonfiction. Uh, writers of fiction, even though they're making it up, they're creating a story, in that sense they are lying, they're able to create through a fabricated narrative a way to look more deeply at a, um, not just a single problem, but sometimes a set of problems. And the topic that Tolstoy looks at here, a topic that resonates with me, but will resonate with you, I think, and with a lot of people, is just the topic of ambition and not just sort of secular ambition, the ambition to get ahead, which by and large I think is a good thing. People um, need to have that spur of ambition to move forward in life. But Tolstoy is also raising the question of whether ambition, not, again, not just secular ambition, but even what can be called spiritual ambition can be a danger, can be, he doesn't use this word in the story, but I want to use it, an idol, an idol. Now, uh, I'll be getting into the story, and I'm probably going to talk about the story for a couple of days, maybe even through the week. I'm not sure. but uh, So I'm going to move into this in a leisurely way. Uh, I want to start by thinking about ambition, not by uh, diving into the story right away, but by looking at um, the famous story in the Bible. Uh, this is from uh, Matthew chapter 19, about Jesus and the rich man. You remember, many of you will remember, 
that the rich man comes to Jesus and he says, um, I want to be your follower. What do I need to do? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And the man goes, well, actually, I have. Uh, I don't do murder. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. I don't bear false witness. I've kept all of them. And um, what, what do I do next? And Jesus said, well, if you really want to be perfect, then go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. So this is a very rich man. And apparently, um, the Gospel of Matthew says, when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. In other words, this was too much for him. He was not willing to do it. But the interesting question is, what was Jesus after in asking him to do it? If you think of what Jesus asked of the rich man, he asked the rich man three things. Number one, go sell your possessions. And the question is, why? Is Jesus trying to tell us that we should sell all our stuff? Number two, give it to the poor. Is Jesus instructing us if we're going to be Christians, we should basically divest ourselves of everything we own? And number three, come and follow me. In my view, it is number three that is the critical instruction here. Um, and uh, what Jesus wants is for us to follow him. And in this case, not in all cases, not with every rich person, but with this particular rich person, you may say his possessions had become his idol. He was so attached to his vast possessions that they were an obstacle to him becoming a true disciple of Christ. So Jesus, recognizing that this was his idol, says to the rich man, you know what? This is taking precedence over me. In order to follow me, you've got to do one and two because my only real, rec my only real demand is three. But three is not possible if your primary attachment is to your possession. So therefore, sell your possessions. Therefore, give away to the poor. Um, and um, so this is not a condemnation of wealth or of having more than someone else. Jesus is not here trying to be an apostle of social justice, a kind of early critical race theory man, none of that. Uh, Jesus is keeping the focus on uh, God coming first and the life of the pilgrim, which is the life we are all called to, uh, taking priority. Now, this is the exact topic that Tolstoy explores in this remarkable story that is called Father Sergius. Now, as the story begins, you've got a very handsome guy, and he's a uh, he's kind of a young prince. Now, he's not the son of the king, uh, but he's a kind of uh, nobleman in the Russian court. And uh, um, his distinguishing quality, now the guy's name is not Father Sergius, that's a name he takes later when he becomes a monk. Um, but, um, but he is a guy, his name is Stefan Kazatsky. And it is said of him, Tolstoy says of him, that he wants to be good at everything he does. He's the kind of guy who whatever he takes up, he seeks to excel. In other words, he is not only ambitious, but he is a kind of perfectionist. And so what he does is he comes to the attention of people at court because he's so good at what he does. He's a kind of a young officer uh, and he's regarded as an up and coming man at court. He recognizes that part of what it means to be an up and coming man at court is to make the right marriage. So he proposes to a noble woman and she accepts it. Uh, and they're on the verge of being married when he discovers to his dismay, he's a, actually a marvelous sort of, he's very good at courtship, he's an excellent dancer, he does all the things that endear him to this woman and she accepts his hand, as I said, but right before they get married, he realizes that she has been a kind of courtesan, she has been a sort of uh, concubine of the czar. And so, completely horrified at this, this is a very straight-laced guy, Prince Stefan, he decides, that's it, I've had it. Uh, I'm going to relinquish this life of being an up-and-coming young nobleman um, and I'm going to enter a monastery. I'm going to pursue a different kind of ambition, not the ambition to worldly success, but the ambition to a uh, spiritual life. Now, um, 
Uh, as he enters the monastery, he begins to perfect, as is his nature, how do you be a good monk? He's obedient, he's hardworking, he does everything that is required of him. All the other monks are amazed at him. He's friendly, he's also self-effacing, so he doesn't, he's not full of airs. And so he's like the ideal monk. Everybody sort of loves him and admires him. Uh, and at one point, his, so his reputation begins to spread for, for holiness and for goodness. And uh, there's a um, very sly young woman who hears about the monk and kind of in a malevolent fashion, she decides, I'm going to test his holiness. And uh, so what does she do? She pretends to be somebody lost in the snow. She bangs on the door of the monastery. Uh, Father Sergius, this is the young monk, doesn't want to let her in. He says, there are only men in here. We are monks. Go away. And she goes, no, who, you're, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're not going to turn away somebody who's in the cold. And so finally he lets her in. And what does she do? She proceeds to try to tempt him. What she does want really is not necessarily to sleep with him, but just to prove that he's human, he's fallible, that he's going to lust after her. Uh, and so she sits in the next room and kind of woos him. And he tries to shut out her voice, but he can't avoid hearing it. And he is, in fact, tempted. And so, and I'm going to sort of leave you with this and pick up the theme tomorrow. What does Father Sergius do? He does something very Russian and very uh, Tolstoyan and very over the top. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.